Good evening, I'm Peter Mansbridge, and this is The National. Security measures for Canada Day hit new heights in Ottawa. You'll see more police cars. You'll see different roads are closed than have been in the past. The U.S. warns of enhanced screening for foreign arrivals, but there is a silver lining. An Ottawa man goes to desperate lengths to keep his daughter safe. By holding them in your house and not letting them out to do drugs, you're breaking the law. So what did police do? Plus the legacy of Newfoundland's cod collapse. 25 years later, has a lesson been learned? You don't want to get it wrong twice. How do you prepare for a party when you're expecting up to half a million guests? Very carefully, with lots of security. Ottawa has already started to close streets and set up barricades ahead of July 1st. Revelers who want to celebrate Canada 150 on the hill will encounter security like they've never seen there before. The goal, says the Prime Minister, is for everyone to be at ease, but be safe. Catherine Cullen now on how the city is working to make that happen. Three, two, one, and two. As straight-laced Ottawa prepares for an influx of fun, there's one aspect of the party prep that's hard to miss. For some folks, it might even be a bonus. Let's go get an ice cream first. The bishops came from Paradise, Newfoundland to celebrate Canada 150 in the capital. It's going to be like really patriotic and I'd say I'm kind of excited for the fireworks and to see all the, uh, the horses. As for all the barricades and other precautions that are already apparent, Gary Bishop doesn't mind at all. Security looks amazing even so far. Uh, a lot of police presence which is, makes everyone feel better about how things are going to happen here. Attacks at public events like the Ariana Grande concert in Manchester are on many people's minds, including the authorities. We're monitoring all the events uh, that are that are happening uh, on the world on the world stage at this time. The contingency plans that we do have in place uh, we're, are appropriate. After truck attacks in Berlin, Nice, and London, authorities will also be putting up barriers to stop anyone from driving into crowds near Parliament Hill. Already, the security preparations are leading to traffic headaches. With many more road closures in the city's downtown core to come, police have a warning. Be patient. It's going to be a quagmire down here uh, for three days. Patience is going to be key. Officials are strongly suggesting that on Canada Day, people arrive two to three hours early. And you can see the preparation for the lineups. It's not just traffic delays. This is where the security lineups are going to happen, snaking back and forth that line. And when people do get to the end of it in this white tent behind me, airport style security checks. Because they're all terrain and they're smaller, they can get through crowd very easily. Paramedics are borrowing extra equipment from other forces and will set up a field hospital downtown in response to large crowds. We feel that we're uh, prepared for whatever uh, Canada they can bring to us. Which is a lot like what the Prime Minister is saying. Every year uh, we uh, step up around Canada Day to ensure uh, that everything is done to keep Canadians safe and uh, I want to uh, make sure that people uh, are at ease because this 150th birthday is supposed to be an unprecedented party for Canada. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. Of course, CBC News will have coverage from Parliament Hill all day on Saturday, starting at 6 a.m. and wrapping up after the fireworks. Security is about to get tougher for many people flying to the United States, but U.S. Homeland Security says in exchange... Laptops and tablets will be allowed back into all airline cabins. The security changes will affect anyone flying directly to the U.S. from a foreign country. Paul Hunter explains. The new requirements would affect all flights coming into the U.S. from nearly 300 airports worldwide, including from Canada, any airport with direct routes to America. Say U.S. authorities, the threat of terror attacks against U.S.-bound passenger jets remains ongoing and serious. Terrorists want to bring down aircraft to instill fear, disrupt our economies and undermine our way of life. And it works, which is why they still see aviation as the crown jewel target in their world. 
We cannot play international whack-a-mole with each new threat. No specific threat was highlighted today, but it's clear the U.S. is worried and wants security stepped up everywhere. Everything from better testing for explosives and carry-ons to enhanced passenger screening, vetting of airport workers, and more sniffer dogs. Make no mistake. Our enemies are constantly working to find new methods for, for disguising explosives, recruiting insiders, and hijacking aircraft. The latest? That laptops can be jerry-rigged into carry-on bombs. In March, the U.S. and then Britain banned laptops and certain other devices from cabins on flights from a list of countries mostly in the Middle East. Turkey, the United Arab Emirates, Egypt, and others, where airport security was deemed weak and the terror threat strong. Beef it up, says the U.S., and fly with laptops again, but fail to beef up security and risk tighter restrictions, maybe even a ban on flying to America. And though the requirements are aimed worldwide, many countries, Canada among them, have long since strengthened their systems already, so Canadians may see little change at their airports. All of it comes as airport security broadly continues to go high-tech. In the U.S., some airlines are already testing face recognition technology, which could soon replace boarding passes. A little bit faster for you. Okay. There we go. Electronic wave-through fingerprint scanning and super high-tech bag scanners. But the fear remains, driven by what the U.S. describes as those who simply want to bring down U.S. passenger jets. An objective, says the U.S., with which terrorists remain obsessed. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. An indication today of how much worse the June 3rd London Bridge attack might have been. Eight people were killed by three attackers armed with knives in a 10-minute rampage. But for a full 90 seconds of that time, one courageous police officer armed only with a baton delayed their progress. It was a one-on-three encounter that put Wayne Marcus into the hospital. He's out now and explains what he did when he saw one of the attackers stabbing a man who was pleading for his life. I take a deep breath and I charge the first one. Soon as I get near him, I swing at him, everything I've got, like all my strength behind it, I'm trying to take him out in the first, in one go. And it's while, while I'm fighting the first one, I get a massive whack to the side of my head. And what it did was it took the vision out of my right eye, like instant lights out, that just went black, even before I started bleeding. Blinded in one eye, Marcus, who is a London transit officer, was fighting the other two men when things got worse. My left leg starts wobbling. It starts wobbling in a weird way. I look down and I see a knife moving up and down in, 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 in the side of my leg. The first attacker had gotten back up and sneaked behind him. And I just have one command, one voice in my head saying, don't go down, don't go down. The officer moved away but was now facing all three. I'm getting ready for them to rush me. But they didn't. Instead, the attackers ran away. Then fellow officers came to aid Marcus. I spat blood out my mouth and I just started giving him my last messages to my missus, to my parents and family. As you can see, those messages didn't need to be delivered. Ukraine says it has a pretty good idea of who unleashed a cyber attack that hit the Eastern European country hard. It wasn't the only nation affected. Systems around the world were still being hit and shut down today by the malicious ransomware. But Ukraine seems to have been the main target. And it says the trail of cyber breadcrumbs leads to one source. Aaron Saltzman has more. Petya hit India's largest port today, bringing operations at one of its three terminals to a dead stop. The entire operations are like shut down. The loading and unloading of shipping containers here is all controlled by software. Software paralyzed by the ransomware attack, which has now infiltrated thousands of networks. 
Petya appears to have hit Ukraine first, downloaded by unwitting users of infected tax software or visitors to a corrupted local news site. The malevolent code then started tearing through major worldwide corporations. Maersk, Mondelez, FedEx, all had data encrypted and a ransom fee demanded to release the systems. CSIC, the agency responsible for cybersecurity in Canada, says so far no government services here have been compromised, but at least one security expert says some Canadian companies have been infected. We always recommend not to pay uh, because once you pay, you get on what we call the sucker list and they will know that you are uh, one of those entities that will pay. Is it possible, though, that most of the victims are being played for suckers? The ransom demand was surprisingly low, just $300 in bitcoins. It was sent from a single email address, which was quickly shut down. And unlike usual malware attacks, this one didn't target a broad range of IP addresses across the Internet. That has some experts suggesting money was not the motive. I would guess that the main attack here was uh, an attack on Ukraine and it was masked by the ransomware attack. An elaborate smokescreen crippled companies around the world merely collateral damage. The real destruction wrought in Ukraine, where banks, government offices, cell phone service, even the power grid were all disrupted all designed to coincide with a national holiday. Ukraine blames Russia. There's no confirmation of that. And another question, since these types of attacks often happen in waves, is there more to come? Aaron Saltzman, CBC News, Toronto. Here's what experts suggest if you get hit by a ransomware attack. First, disconnect your computer from the internet. That will reduce the chance of infecting others. Report the attack to police and seek the help of experts who specialize in data recovery. They may have options. As always, prevention is the key. The main advice is to make sure you keep your computer software updated, install antivirus software, and back up everything. Coming up, going through cancer surgery is grueling enough without a surprise like this. How can you do two months with that inside? Plus, why cookie dough can land you in hospital? An Ottawa man broke the law to protect his de teenage daughter, and he's prepared to do it again if the city doesn't step up. Sean O'Leary says there are not enough services for drug-addicted teens, and that's why he was forced to take an extreme measure. He told his story to the CBC's Julie Ireton. Paige O'Leary likes getting ready to go out with friends. She's 16 and in many respects a typical suburban teenager, with one exception, her addiction. Xanax and cocaine mostly, nothing else. Okay. Do you have any concerns that there might be something in the Xanax that you're taking? Uh, yes, there quite possibly could be fentanyl in it because there's fentanyl in basically everything right now. Like people that terrifies her parents. And it's why her dad recently took a desperate measure, forcing Paige to stay at home and stay off drugs. Sean O'Leary knows that's illegal. By holding them in your house and not letting them out to do drugs, you're breaking the law. Like everything, any options as a family that we're left with, require us to break the law. But Paige knows her rights. Recently held against her will, she managed to find a phone and call 911. Police came to the house and picked her up. I'll just ask them to drive me to Canada or whatever, just so I can go do drugs. They just proceeded to drive her to Tim Hortons in Canada. So in the end, she got her free Uber ride that she wanted it in the first place. And there was dad sitting back at home going, what the heck happened? This officer who works with young people isn't surprised by the situation. They're over 16, really. There's, there's nothing we could do to make that youth stay. And, we, and they have that freedom to go at any point in time if they wish. And that's left O'Leary feeling powerless. He reached out to other parents and founded a support group to seek solutions. He's complained about the lack of detox beds for teens in Ottawa and the long waiting lists for addiction treatment. 
O'Leary says kids need on-demand detox and counselling, especially when they reach out for help. When your daughter or your son finally looks at you and wants help or wants to go to the Royal or wants to go to a meeting or wants to talk, there's got to be somewhere to talk, someone to talk to and right now there's not. O'Leary says he wishes he didn't have to break the law, but if it means saving his daughter, he'll do it again. Julie Ireton, CBC News, Ottawa. It's been quite some time since the politics of Northern Ireland made international headlines, but it is suddenly very relevant again, partly as a result of the recent British election and partly because the country's internal tensions have bubbled back to the surface. The CBC's Margaret Evans explains. The brooding menace of the troubles in Northern Ireland is still preserved on Belfast streets in murals like these found in the pro-British Unionist and Irish Republican heartlands. Muralist Danny Deveni is a former IRA prisoner. History is like a rear view mirror. You should always check back, but not too often. The murals are a reminder of the bloodshed the Good Friday Peace Accord sought to end 19 years ago. But new clouds on the horizon have led some to fear for its future. The deal creating the Northern Ireland Assembly here at Stormont essentially forces nationalists and unionists to govern together in a devolved parliament. But it collapsed in January, forcing new elections and creating political stalemate again. The main players, the Republican Sinn Féin and the pro-British Democratic Unionist Party, or DUP, have until tomorrow to agree a deal or face a return to rule by Westminster. At the moment, the indications are not particularly encouraging. The red line issues for Sinn Féin are still there, uh, particularly around their demand for uh, an Irish language act. Republicans are unhappy the DUP has agreed to prop up the British Prime Minister Theresa May's minority government in exchange for money for the region. I think it's kind of a, a stick that the British government and the DUP are trying to wield against Sinn Féin to try to force them into a deal. Sectarian lines have never really faded here. So-called peace walls still divide Protestants and Catholics. Do you want to make it serious? Make it serious? Yes. And most schools remain segregated. Best friends AJ and Rachel breached the divide, but only through a cross-community project called Peace Players, teaching kids basketball. Like if I was to walk around in my school uniform in a Protestant area, it wouldn't be, wouldn't end well. <laughs> so I think if we kind of make our own experiences and our own views, like it'll just completely fade away. For now, though, many parts of Belfast remain carefully delineated grids of suspicion and distrust symbols stronger to some than Northern Ireland's devolved government. Margaret Evans, CBC News, Belfast. The Italian government says the country has reached the saturation point when it comes to accepting migrants arriving from North Africa on non-Italian boats. More than 10,000 have come in just the past four days, almost 75,000 so far this year. Italy is demanding that other EU states do more to help the humanitarian crisis. Straight ahead, it's something no surgeon should ever do. Mr. Drew's successor on the first ballot, John Diefenbaker, MP for Prince Albert, Saskatchewan. There are no words for the highest honor uh, that you can confer on a member of this party. <laughs> Mr. Robert Stanfield. We're going to leave here the United Party, party that has had some differences, but which is now determined to get on with the job. Thank you very much. Mr. Clark. 1,187 votes. We will not take this nation by storm, by stealth, or by surprise. 
We will win it by work. Ryan Mulroney is the new leader of the Progressive Conservative Party. Awesome, but together we're going to build a brand new party and a brand new country. Thank you all. As expected, second ballot win for Kim Campbell. It has been clear for the last hour and a half. The hugs, the kisses, the emotion for the winner. You have honored me by your trust, and I return it with my complete commitment to you to lead this party in a great tradition. Well, there you go. You've got the convention floor hug. There you go. The shaking of hands. We work together to build this party. All right. We are now on a journey together. The road to success starts with all of us, all of us in this hall. Stephen Harper accepting his first Valley victory uh, cheers from his supporters as he goes down to his place. We are heirs to the founders of this country and to the legacy of the electoral success from Sir John A. Macdonald through to Brian Mulroney. And what we've done today is add the democratic energy and grassroots power of a new age. A possible hint of an interest rate hike today coming from the Bank of Canada governor in an interview with the U.S. business news channel CNBC. Well, rates are, of course, extraordinarily low, and we cut them uh, by 50 basis points in 2015 to counteract the effects of the oil price shock, speed up the adjustment. It does look as though those cuts have done their job. Uh, After Polos made those comments, the dollar hit a four-month high climbing to 76.57 cents U.S. Take a look at this x-ray. Now imagine the nightmare scenario behind it. You go into hospital for surgery and a long metal plate gets left behind inside your body. As Alison Northcott tells us, that's what actually happened to a woman in Montreal. When Sylvie Dubé was diagnosed with ovarian cancer last year, it was a shock. She went through chemo, then had surgery. I was very anxious uh, because it was the uh, uh, first time for me, first time in the, in the hospital and uh, first time in cancer too. Afterwards, she had pain in her shoulder, not in her abdomen, but says nurses told her that was common. When it wouldn't go away, she started getting anxious. The pain uh, always in uh, continue uh, in ribs and shoulder, in ribs and shoulders. I would like to, I want to try to find solution. She consulted her oncologist and another doctor who x-rayed her shoulder, but neither found the source of the problem. After two months of suffering, she went to the emergency room and was shocked by what they found in an x-ray, a long surgical tool. And the doctor passed a scan and they find the, the object, the, the tools, the doctor said. Uh, how can you do two months with that inside? This is 33 centimeters, the length of the metal object that was left in Dubé's body after her surgery. It stretched from her pelvis to her rib cage. Dubé had a second surgery to have the object removed. The University of Montreal Hospital Network is investigating. Très rare. Dr. Charles Bellevance, Director of Medical and University Affairs, says it's a very rare occurrence and that corrective measures will be taken. While it is rare for objects to be left in patients following surgery, it does happen. In Canada, there are 8.6 cases for every 100,000 procedures. In Quebec, that number is 11.6. Quebec Health Minister Gaetan Barrette, a doctor himself, says there are protocols in operating rooms for counting and recounting equipment before and after a procedure. He says in this case there was an error. Dubé says the hospital has apologized. She has filed a complaint and is considering legal action. All this as she continues her cancer treatment. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Because of the recent E. coli outbreak connected to flour, Health Canada is warning people about something they may already know, but do anyway. Eat raw cookie dough and other things with uncooked flour. The consequences can be painful, even fatal. So as Christine Birak tells us, it's worth the reminder. 
first cooking is getting the next stop. It's baking time in this kitchen and time for a pop quiz on raw foods that can make you sick. Which do you need to handle safely? Chicken, eggs, can I keep this? Or flour? Matthew, your scoop next. The answer? All of the above. If you missed flour, you're clearly not alone. Is it good? Mm -hmm. Do you like it? They might like it, but Health Canada is reminding Canadians it's not safe to taste or eat raw cookie dough or any other products containing uncooked flour. It can be contaminated with harmful bacteria, including E. coli, that can make you sick. But flour is not something I would ever consider telling the kids to be careful around or taking care with because it's not something you think of as having that in it. But wheat and raw flour have always carried risks. It can get contaminated by water, uh, manure that's spread onto the land, even the transporters used to transport the grain to the flour mills. While rare, a recent E. coli outbreak made 30 Canadians sick, including a two-year-old BC boy who was hospitalized for a month after eating cookie dough. The Canadian Food Inspection Agency has issued a massive recall on flour products used in everything from batter and pie shells to pizza dough and even homemade Play-Doh. Over the years, eating raw flour has become normalized by the marketing of cookie dough products such as ice cream. Here at Chapman's, they test a sample from every chunk before it's sold. Well, we are overly cautious in everything that we do, and food safety is our number one priority. But some experts say E. coli can be missed by spot testing, and flour should be heated to kill any bacteria. Absolutely. Uh, testing is notoriously inaccurate. So it's like finding a needle in a haystack. Food safety experts say you should treat flour like chicken. Clean any surface it touches, including counters, bowls, and wash your hands. And save your sampling until after that dough has been cooked or baked into actual cookies. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Up next, it's been 25 years since a dark day in Newfoundland. There's a lot of people's homes are gonna be gone, cars gone. The dish is going back to the soup kitchen days. Desperate times were in store when the cod fishery closed. Now some people fear what might come next. And when his homeland is in the spotlight, of course, we want to hear from Rex. Time to check the day's markets. The TSX rose 74 points. The dollar jumped three quarters of a cent. In New York, the Dow gained 143 points and the price of oil closed up 50 cents a barrel. I'll tell you a quick story about Obama. Um, it, it was a big deal for us. It was, a, you know, the first time that, that I'd uh, had an interview with a, a U.S. president while, while in office. In fact, I think it was the first time CBC had ever had a one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, with a U.S. president. He'd just taken office, he'd only been there a month, uh, so it, it, it was a big deal. Um, we didn't get a lot of time with him, I think it was 12 minutes or something it ended up being, uh, and they were in a real rush to, to move him along because he had to fly out to the western United States somewhere, so the helicopter was waiting on the, the pad outside. So um, they, they bring him in, he, you know, he, it was in the map room of the, the White House, right on the, the main floor. He walks in, has the arm out, he says, Peter, welcome to the White House. Great to have you here. And I'm going, jeez, this is great. You know? <laughs> the guy obviously must watch us online every night. You know? <laughs> so he sits down, and we you know, do a little small talk while they're setting up the mics and everything, and that was all very nice. Uh, and then we get into the interview, and it was bang, bang, bang. It was all the things you'd expect, Afghanistan, the economy. Uh, there was stuff about the, uh, the oil sands. There was a, ver a variety of different questions. And he showed a remarkable knowledge of, of Canada, and he'd obviously been properly briefed on, on some, of these, some of these issues. Then suddenly, you know, it was over. And he says, uh, you know, thanks very much. We shake hands. His people are on him like immediately, saying, "We've got to go, Mr. President." So, off he went out the door. And so I, you know, I'm, I'm going, "Wow!" I just you know, interviewed the President of the United States, and after you turn to the crew to make sure they actually were recording when you were doing it, <laughs> I, I looked at uh, uh, 
producer who'd done a lot of the work to, to, to make this happen. Her name was Samira Hussein. She works for the BBC now, right, in, in, uh, in New York. And I looked at Samira, who was sitting on the floor, just basically right between the president and I during the, the, the news here. We were just out of, uh, during the interview, but just out of camera range. And I said, so, Samira, how did it go? What do you think? And Samira Hussein was like the gold medal winner at Concordia, or she's like a great young journalist. She looked at me and she went, he's so gorgeous. <laughs> 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 so I said, yeah, right, of course, but, you know, did we get what we came here for? And she said, I don't know, I didn't hear a word he said. <laughs> so as that's happening, there's suddenly this kind of noise at the, at the door, at the, at the entrance, and look up, and it's, it's him again. It's the President of the United States. He's coming back in, he's going, Peter! Because, you know, we're... <laughs> He says, I've got somebody you have to meet. And I said, I'm thinking, the President of the United States, that's somebody I have to meet? Yeah. This is like crazy. And he's tall, right? I'm, I'm six foot, he's like six two. And the guy beside him was about six five. Big tall guy. And he looks at him. And this is the answer to Paul's second question. He looks at him, he says, this is Marvin Nicholson. He's from Victoria. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going, he's gone out, you know, he's heading to the helicopter, he's met some other Canadian, and he's brought him back in the White House. I didn't take the fish from the goddamn water. But who took it? Tempers are bound to burn hot when a whole way of life is under threat. That was the case 25 years ago in Newfoundland and Labrador when the federal government shut down the northern cod fishery. Stocks of the fish were critically low, almost to the point of no return. So just like that, tens of thousands of people saw their livelihood disappear. Tonight, Red Sharon revisits those hard, hard times. Has anything really changed in the quarter century since? Here's Wrench. Well, Peter, this isn't exactly the picture that comes to mind for most people when they think of Newfoundland, but 25 years ago, these doors and what was going on on either side represented the end of almost 500 years of Newfoundland history fishing the northern cod. Come on, come on, come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Now listen. It was quite a scene playing out on national television. Outside, barred from the room, angry Newfoundland fishermen trying to get in. This is an amount that, the, uh, that we think should look after any emergency. While inside, federal fisheries minister John Crosby was presiding over the largest mass layoff in Canadian history. Crosby, did you expect this kind of reaction when you brought this announcement down? They don't need to go berserk, trying to batter on doors to frighten me. But this day, July 2nd, 1992, was more like the end of the story. The beginning of the story is out here on the North Atlantic. The breeding grounds of the northern cod, a species once so plentiful, it was said you could almost walk on their backs across the water. No sign of cod this morning, or much of anything else, besides ice. As far as the eye can see, out there somewhere are Gord Jane's crab and lobster pots. There's times you got to take a chance, right? Well, you thought you were clear of it enough to put the pots in the water. Yeah, we did, and and seemed like when noise came in, it came in so fast that we never had time to get the gear up anyway. 
my pots are out there probably a couple of miles. When the ice backs off now, we'll go out and take inventory and see if there's anything left. Whatever's left, we'll try to figure out how to make a living with. Call it insult to injury. Lobster season will be soon over. You got some lobsters pounded there. Yeah, that's what we got uh, caught so far the year. That's it? That's it. Great price, no lobsters. Just another reminder of 25 years of struggle. He used to keep his cod traps in here. Where are your cod traps these days? Well, actually, I, I cut out two and burned them. Yeah. Burned for scrap when they shut it all down. Not that he was surprised. You know, eventually it had to happen, right? And uh, I think uh, it took someone like John Crosby, I think, to really uh, put it into perspective and say that, you know, this is enough, we've got to be shut down. And, and uh, I hate to admit it, but, you know, the man was right. Uh, you know, it definitely had to be shut down. There was nowhere for them to hide. In the 60s, 70s, and 80s, modern technology found its way to the high seas, the spawning grounds of the northern cod, and a systematic process of elimination began. 12 months of the year, 24 hours a day, they fished. A large Canadian fleet, but foreigners too. The Spanish, Portuguese, and the Russians. From 1962 to 1977 alone, the harvestable biomass of the northern cod dropped 82 percent. But scientists kept overestimating the stock size. And Canadian politicians kept setting higher quotas. But inshore, the thousands of fishermen who also relied on that fish could see what was happening. Glenn Winslow certainly could. Because we see the catch rates going down, you know, around the land. I mean, yeah. and I'll tell you another thing we see. We see the fish getting smaller. He had just invested a million dollars into a bigger operation to chase the fish offshore. We took possession of a new boat rigged for codfish and ground fish. And, and when was that? That was, uh, that was two weeks before the moratorium. And two weeks later, closed her down. Couldn't believe it. These days, the man who had to deliver the news lives here. This is my chair in the House of Commons. Right. 25 years later, John Crosby still calls it the worst moment of his political career. As a senior Newfoundland member of the Mulroney government, it fell to him to shut down 500 years of fishing. He got an inkling of what he was facing the day before in the fishing community of Bay Bulls. And when I saw this angry mob there, uh, I knew that if I showed any timidity or, uh, or that I looked frightened or, or that they could scare me or whatever, that I had, to take, I had to take the first step. You decided the best defense was a good offense. At the beginning, I knew that I, I, had, to, that I had to do something unusual. And he I did. He you, attacked. I didn't, I didn't take the fish from the goddamn water. But who took it? You and your goddamn people took it. You and your people took it. You could have wound up in the harbor. <laughs> yeah. I, I might have been over the war. I, I probably would have been in the harbor myself that day. <laughs> Emergency situation that's been on now for years. This is not the first year that I've had a disaster. The next day, the day he had to lay off almost 40,000 people, it got worse. There are too many people trying to make a living from that resource at the present time. When the fishermen heard the initial compensation package would amount to about $225 a week, he got to have us, buddy. they decided to confront Crosby, who had been barricaded inside. Glenn Winslow was in the crowd. That's one of his crew members trying to beat down the door. One of the, the fellows that you'll see it on, on, on the news every now and then trying to get into the door actually fished with me that day. What they didn't know at the time was that they were actually doing John Crosby 
a favor. Nice, actually nice to see you. Have a good holiday. Brian Mulrooney and his cabinet had been elected preaching fiscal restraint. The package was the best Crosby could do until the cabinet saw the racket on national television. It probably helped to get a better compensation. Oh, well, definitely, oh, it definitely did. The cost of the compensation program, which originally we had thought might be uh, several, several hundred million, uh, turned out to be four billion dollars, as far as I know. <laughs> Glenn Winslow has an admission too. John Crosby was right. But now, when you look back at it 25 years later, what do you think of the decision? Oh, it was definitely the right decision. It should have been made earlier. For a while, the oil and gas industry helped people find work. Or the province's Labrador mega power project. But the real cost was paid in the people lost. Tens of thousands left. It's like someone died in the family. It's like someone took away your rights. Oh. There's a lot of people's homes are going to be gone, cars gone. But this is going back to the soup kitchen days. Deep down in my gut today, there's a knob and a tear in my eye to look out, like I said, where I once, where I once belonged and don't belong there anymore. Take care. Take care. It's always really been about the fish. Glenn Winslow and his crew survived by going even bigger. So this has all the technology? That's two right. GPSs, right. there's two sounders aboard. Yeah. There's actually three radars aboard, Yeah. two computers. What's a boat like this worth? This one today, I'd say should be well over two million. When you get into a vessel like this, Reg, and the debt that's involved in it, yeah. and you have only so much time in the year to uh, make the, 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 the capital that's required yeah. to keep this vessel going. That's your pressure. That's right. And that pressure landed right on other species, like crab and shrimp, both lucrative fisheries that everyone wanted to fish. It helped the value of the seafood industry in the province top $1.4 billion last year, a record. But there's a problem. There's every indication they too are now in trouble. Quotas have been severely cut. Gord Janes went at the crab too. His wife Pat worked in the boat with him. Doubling the household income helped them survive. Now his quota has been cut almost in half. He's heard people arguing the crab stock has declined because of environmental conditions. He no. just doesn't believe it. They blame the environmental issue for the disappearance of the cod too, you know. There's nothing environmental about overfishing. You know, you take, you're taking too much. And the, you know, it's as simple as that. Uh, yeah, species can't take the pressure. It can't, you know, it just can't. How much cod do you suppose has been landed here over the centuries? I can imagine a fair bit was landed here. And now the pressure is back on the federal fishery scientists to allow them to, once again, increase northern cod fishing. But 25 years later, the spawning biomass is still barely a third the size it needs to be to sustain a commercial fishery. Where did your grandfather fish? He fished off uh, Western Bay, I think. Karen Dwyer is the government's lead biologist on northern cod. She's heard the fisheries union calling to increase quotas. She's resisting. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that pressure? That pressure is definitely there, especially for fisheries managers. Um, I think because the stock is still where it is in that lower half of the critical zone, yeah. I think that it's not the answer right now, but it does indicate we need to be more careful. Yeah. with what we're doing on this stock. Yeah, we, we can't get this wrong twice. No. Yeah. We don't want to get it wrong twice. 
So for now, the most widespread cod fishery will remain recreational. Any Newfoundlander is allowed to fish for cod to eat during certain times in the summer. So this is the working deck out here, yeah? Yes, it is, yeah. Glenn Winslow is gearing up for the possibility of increased commercial quotas anyway. But he says the days of the old way of doing things have to be gone. You know, I think everyone is starting to realize now that uh, for this fishery to survive in the future, you know, it, after 25 years of a moratorium, that we better get the technology right. We better get the way we're harvesting fish right, because if we don't, I'll tell you, it'll be 25 years wasted. Still, when you ask the question, so do you think anything has really changed? Uh, well, I'll tell you what. You're taking a long time to answer that one. Uh, I hope they have. I don't know if they really have. Gord Jaynes has very little faith that much has changed. So history is repeating itself. History is repeating itself, sir, exactly the way I predicted and you can mark that down somewhere, because that's the way it's going to go. Or that the Northern Cod will really be back anytime soon. I'm going to guarantee you, I won't live long enough to see the cod fishery back in full tilt. If people think, you know, that we're going to get the, the right to fish cod like we did one time, forget it, it's not going to happen. His wife has turned to painting for a hobby and to make a few dollars but her fishing days are done. Not a real good outlook, is it? Gore Jane says he won't be far behind her. If he can find his pots, he'll finish out the year, but he may then join the ranks of thousands of others who have turned their backs on the fishery for the last time. Ed Sharon, CBC News in Salvage, Newfoundland. Well, when the subject is Newfoundland and Labrador and its special way of life, we always like to hear from a certain man of the people. Rex, he's up next. One of the highlights of the sports year throughout Western Europe, the International Auto Exhibit. By and large, the designers and manufacturers have worked toward the goal of producing a car that will carry the most people the farthest at the lowest cost. But comfort remains a factor. And as far as gadgetry is concerned, the European car makers are in a neck and neck race with their American counterparts. Transporting cargo is no problem for the XP883. The automobile may be a form of transportation a way of getting from here to there, but it's also much more. It has served Americans as a status symbol, a love object, and an instrument of adolescent machismo. Suddenly we become aware that families that would never dream of purchasing a $100 painting are eager to spend $7,000 for a gleaming striped and chromed hunk of metal. In their eyes, this suggests beauty. This particular car is all electric, yes, and you remember we came in the front door here, uh, it's very simple. There's a brake and an accelerator and one position for forward and one position for reverse and that's all there is to it. You just seal this up by pulling this down. Right. Let's try it. Oh, there. How about that? Do you suppose we'll ever get out again? I don't know. I feel like uh, preserved here like some uh, peaches. Now, we realize the emphasis is on wheels, but we never expected to find this. It's called the Panther 6 because it has six wheels, two on the back, four on the front. The Panther is now handmade just outside Vancouver and uses a huge Cadillac turbo engine. How fast? 200 miles an hour. How much? $200,000. Wow. <laughs> so what will you be driving in 25 years? This prototype was designed to travel at 240 kilometers per hour. TV cameras mounted inside the back of the car feed the driver pictures of what's happening behind. And what you do is you program in where you want to go and where you are, and on this screen you'll get a digitized map that shows you the best alternative route to take. This car just might take the place of some airplane flights.
Here the tides flow. That's the signature line of Newfoundland's greatest poet, E.J. Pratt, followed as a nature by, and here they ebb. On July 2nd, 1992, they ebbed with a vengeance. The date that, in my mind anyway, has as its only rival, March 31st, 1947, when we joined Confederation. John Crosby on that day, brave man that he was and is, went to a wharf on the southern shore to announce the Cod Moratorium. It's always bad news when government announcements reach for Latin nouns. Well, from the days since Elizabeth I was queen and John Cabot on a search for China stumbled into Bonavista, the fishery drew people here. And on that day, it was denied the mainstay of the Newfoundland generations and all the trade and craft that went with it. Economically, the moratorium was savage. All Newfoundland inshore fishermen instantly found themselves without work. Culturally, the hit was greater. The greatest, most significant continuity in the tenacious Newfoundland way of outport life had been snapped, the cord broken. The fishery was in all the ways that count, the be all and the end all of the Newfoundland way. It determined how the island was settled. It set the patterns of life, language and livelihood. It was dotted with hardship and tragedy, and it also bred resilience, inventiveness, high spirits, dark humor, and hospitality. Psychologically, I'm not sure the collapse of the Newfoundland fishery is fully measured now. It ripped the heart out of our intimacy with the sea, put a stay on the cruel and joyful exchange, it's always been both, between Newfoundlanders and what they have always known and done best. Cope with a hard life of precarious toil, yet find a measure of joy and triumph in making do. Most of all, it put a seal on outport life, the great nursery of the Newfoundland tongue, the font and fountain of folk music, story, and song, and the tablet on which a unique way of life was engraved. Out of the cramped and yet rich life of the outports emerged the full strength and force of Newfoundland character, which found its highest representation in the dramatic chronicle of the great artist and printmaker David Blackwood. His prints, the Labrador fishery, the seal hunt, and life on the northeast coast shoot the story of Newfoundland into realms of myth. Newfoundland life and culture have always been the outport. St. John's is merely the biggest one. And with the moratorium began the unraveling of its reason to be. With the fishery closed, the young and old, particularly the young, fled to other shores, out west to Alberta, which was a great salvation for many. Further afield to, to the oil rigs off Mexico and the African coast. The economic focus shifted to the offshore oil. Both began the unpeopling of the historic coastal communities. They are now, so many of them, shells of their former being, places to visit more than to live in, and sirens for tourists, heart-stoppingly deanimated vessels of nostalgia. The fishery may return, but never as it was. It cannot. 25 years ago, a tide ebbed that may never be full again. For The National, I'm Rex Murphy. I'm Mike Finnerty. Tomorrow on the summer edition of The Current, food researcher Lenore Newman says Canada's distinctive Creole cuisine is a sign of the success of multiculturalism. The summer edition of The Current, weekdays at 8.30 on CBC Radio 1. Each working day of the year throughout Canada, the post office handles about 10 million pieces of mail. The men who face the gigantic task of sorting this mass of mail must know the names of 13,000 cities, towns, and villages in Canada. In the last decade, its reputation for quick, dependable service has been smashed by literally hundreds of labor disturbances. Its deficit has risen to an astonishing $600 million a year, and its automation program is so far behind schedule, no one can estimate when it'll be finished. Canadians are losing patience. They're increasingly fed up, and so am I. 
the post office will become a crown corporation. In rural communities across Canada, the post office is more than a place to buy stamps and pick up your mail, and this one is no exception. It's, it's really the center of the village. But Canada Post says it loses money. These new super boxes will replace Vernon Dunlop. There's no contact with an, uh, an aluminum box and a key. We want to have a community life. About 30 groups of angry residents from across Canada kicked off a national campaign today to get rid of super mailboxes. Ann Derrett lives in Markham, just north of Toronto. She doesn't get home mail delivery. Every weekday, either she or her husband trudges about 100 meters to the neighborhood mailbox. Derrett hates that trek so much, she helped found RAM residents against mailboxes. Ram Mulrooney mailboxes. Well, the post office delivered something today it hasn't been able to for 30 years, a profit. Canada Post says it made almost a hundred million dollars in the past year and it expects even bigger profits in the future. Canadians are making fewer trips to the mailbox. This is the main culprit, email, now as mainstream as a Hollywood blockbuster movie convincing the millions of Canadians who use it to come back to so-called snail mail won't be easy. Why would I want to mail a letter and post it and go to the, mail, to the mailbox? Why? Big change for many Canadians. The end of home mail delivery in urban centres. On doorsteps across the country today, there came plenty of reaction to the big changes at Canada Post. I like to have things delivered and everyone cuts back and it's so silly. Like the milkman a generation or more ago, the days of daily visits from your friendly letter carrier will soon seem like a quaint notion from another era. The National. The National. Tonight. Summer is golden on CBC Sports. Come on, y'all, it's time to rise up. The creator of Paddington Bear, Michael Bond, has died at the age of 91. Inspired by a teddy bear Bond bought for his wife, based on memories of child evacuees and refugees in the Second World War, and named after the train station he used daily. The first story about the accident-prone bear from darkest Peru was published in 1958. I think he's got a very strong sense of right and wrong. He's a very polite, polite bear, rather based on my father. My father was a very polite man and always wore a hat in case he met somebody and thought had to have something to raise. In 2014, Paddington raised his hat to Bond, who made a cameo in the Paddington movie. Paddington books have sold 35 million copies in 40 languages. Michael Bond's publicist says he died yesterday after a short illness. That's the National this Wednesday night. My last time in this studio, working with a fabulous studio crew and an equally great control room crew. I still have one more National to do this Friday, but it will be from Ottawa on the eve of our big Canada Day show on Saturday. But now, it's goodbye to Studio 52. It's been a kind of great second home. I'm Peter Mansbridge. Thanks for watching.